preach a little bit on the, something that goes right along with that, I guess. The title of the message this morning is, God deals well with those who fear Him. God deals well with those who fear them. And that comes right from our text as we talk about the life of Moses. Uh, I talked about last, last time I was here, a couple weeks ago, how the chapter 1 begins the life of Moses, but his life began before uh, his birth. And uh, I talked about that a little bit. And chapter 2 actually talks about his birth, but we're still going to be in chapter 1. Okay, I want to talk about something that happens here. Uh, it's not actually the life of Moses, although it was in, uh, in part of this story before his birth. But I really think it's a good uh, topic for us to talk about. And that is starting in verse 15. So if you would, find Exodus 1, 15, and then stand, if you would, as I read uh, to the end of the chapter. Exodus 1, verse 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When ye do the office of the midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son... Then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then shall ye, uh, then shall she, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men ch children alive. And the king of Egypt of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. For they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt uh, with them, I'm sorry, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray you help us uh, now as we receive it, and help me as I preach it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you could be seated. <clears throat> I think everybody in here knows a midwife uh, is someone that helps to deliver a baby. Uh, I do still know a lot of people that use midwives. Uh, my wife, unfortunately, has had to have C-sections all of the births, and so she hasn't had that, that option. But that would be my preference, really, I, I think, to have the idea even to have a child at home. I've got many friends who've had the children at home, and it uh, seems maybe a little strange in our culture today. Uh, but the midwife comes in and helps the, uh, the lady to deliver the child. She has some education, some knowledge about the subject. And then after the child's delivered, she kind of helps to, uh, you know, the rest of the process there. And anyway, if you notice here in this passage that the midwives were Hebrews themselves. Okay, so they, these are slaves. You know, these are people, uh, it says in verse 15, the king spake unto the Hebrew midwives. And so they were there just like all the other Hebrews. They, they, it was just their job was to go in and to help deliver these babies. And so they had appointed them to this, to this job. And the thing is, they gave a very clear, the king gave a very clear order that says, when you, you know, are delivering these children and you see a man. See, they really wanted to stop the population growth among the Hebrews. So they said, when you see a man child that's born, kill it. Now that seems crazy. I'm like, who, I mean, if you're a reasonable thinking person, you're like, who could just murder a baby? But then again, in our society, it's becoming more and more like, uh, it's just becoming easier for people to do, I guess. Okay, but uh, in that society, probably the same thing. Maybe in, it wasn't such a shocking thing. But here's what we know, that these Hebrew midwives said, I can't do that. That's against God. And, uh, and it says that they feared God. That's the real reason. They might have told the Hebrew, I mean, they might have told the, uh, the king of Egypt, well, we did it because, like, when we got there, like, they were already born. And so, like, we, uh, whatever excuse they gave, the reason is, in the narration, the Bible says they feared God. And that's why they weren't going to do that. They weren't going to kill these innocent babies. And so, of course, the Hebrews continued to multiply and to grow. <clears throat> and the thing is, like, they were, they were caught... Allowing, they were caught kind of breaking the rule. Now, it sounds to me like they were a little dishonest and they told a lie, and I'm not 
recommending that anybody ever lie to get out of trouble. Uh, but at the same time, we see that a lot of times in the Bible, like whenever Michael, you know, helps uh, David get away, and then she tells a little lie about he was going to kill me. Or when uh, Ray, Rahab, the harlot, you know, is, lets the spies out, and, and, and she, you know, she tells a lie as well. And, and uh, you know, but God still used those, and they ended up being kind of good things because, you know, the people had protected God's people. I'm not saying it's ever right to lie, but I'm just saying that's just the, the case of what, of what happened here. Okay, so she was kind of being dishonest, I, I would sus suspect, but the real reason is because they said, I just can't do something that terrible and actually kill a baby. That would be against God, and God would judge me. And God looked upon their disobedience to the government, which isn't, again, not something that we normally would recommend. The Bible even says that we're supposed to, you know, obey the ordinances of, 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 that are given to us by our, our governors and all, uh, so much as they don't contradict God's commands. At the point that they contradict God's commands, we have to make a decision. Do I obey God or do I obey man? And of course, we see cases in the Bible where God approves of people disobeying their government because it goes against, against uh, His commandments. But I would suspect that choosing, uh, deciding to make this choice, the midwives recognized they could lose their lives. Don't you think? I mean, it, the king had all that power, and he had the ability to do that. I mean, to make an order that you would just go kill these babies, and uh, to make an order that they would, you know, uh, they would rule over the Hebrews the way that they did, and inflict uh, pain and suffering on them, and increase their laborers whenever they wanted to, and, and whip them, and beat them, and do whatever. It's no doubt that he could have made the midwives' lives miserable, and could have punished them, maybe even, I mean, he could have even killed them, uh, if, if he so chose. But the Bible says there in verse 20 that God dealt with the midwives. He dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. And then in verse 21 it says it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. I don't even understand exactly what that means, to be honest with you. Now I've read some different commentaries in the past and thought, like, I mean, I think one person's guess is as good as another person's. But he made them houses. Now, the Hebrews had houses that they lived in, you know, I think. The way, the way that I understand it, they had houses and they had a certain region that they, they lived in. But it seems to me like there was something special about these midwives and the condition that they were allowed to live in that was part of God. You know, like blessing them for fearing him. And, uh, and it's kind of interesting to think about that. But in this sermon, my goal is to bring up this biblical principle that God deals well with those who fear him. Okay, and so I'm going to uh, bring that out in this passage, and, and uh, I want to give some appropriate application for us all because we're all going to have to make choices in our life to fear God and obey his commandments. So let me start off by saying, what does it mean to fear God? Okay, so first of all, what does it mean to fear God? Fearing God, it could mean a lot of things to different people. I mean, you say fear, you think, oh, I'll shake in and tremoring and, and uh, knees knocking together. There are cases in the Bible where we see that. People were so afraid of God. Uh, you know, I always think about the, uh, not Nebuchadnezzar, but what's the other guy, the I can't think in Daniel. Uh, he's the king there that uh, Belshazzar, no, not Belshazzar, that's, da that's Daniel, right? Uh, Belshazzar, uh, whatever his name is in Daniel. <laughs> My mind's slipping. But he sees the writing on the wall and everything, and it says his knees knock together. And you can see the cartoon image in your head about some, uh, you know, scared uh, person, little wimpy king or whatever, and his knees are knocking together. But there are times in the Bible where people come face to face with not necessarily God himself, but, but a, 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 an image that God allows them to see, maybe an angel or something like that, and they know in essence they're in the presence of God, and they fear. Some of them fall on their face, some of them are uh, kind of like pass out where they, like there's no life in them, and, uh, and, and they fear God because they recognize his holiness, they recognize how much higher he is than them, and they have this utmost respect and, uh, and healthy fear for him. But then there are also people that will say, yeah, but when we fear God, it's not really like that. Like we fear him, meaning that we just respect him, we honor him, and, and all that. And I think both are true. 
But I, didn't, I don't minimize the word fear by saying, well, you're not supposed to be afraid of what God will do to you because He loves you and He would never harm you. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, you want to go against God and you don't think that He could chasten you or discipline you or even take your life if He wants to? Of course He could. Get this, He could throw you in hell if He wanted to. Right? And I'll read the passage of Scripture about that in a minute. You're like, no, he couldn't because I'm safe. I mean, that's true. He's not going to because he's already promised in his word that if you put faith in his son, Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. But doesn't he have the power to do it? He's going to throw other people in hell. And so, like, you know, if you recognize he has that authority, he has that ability, obviously we focus on the fact that he's merciful and he's not going to do that because we received Jesus Christ. But we must respect the fact that he has that power. And, uh, and he will do that to many people. So that's something to, uh, to respect. Look at Genesis chapter 20. Fearing God, though, is more of a worldview. Okay, it's a worldview that causes people to choose to obey God's laws because they recognize he's supreme and he's all powerful. Look at Exodus, I mean, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 20 and verse 11. Verse 11 says, And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. You know the story? He goes into Egypt, and he's afraid that they're going to take his wife because they like have no fear of God. This is, in essence, what he's saying. Uh, he's like, The reason I lied to you and said that my wife was my sister is because I was afraid you were going to take my wife. She's beautiful. Uh, I mean, this is a woman that even in, at 90 years old, he's afraid that they're going to steal her uh, from him. So she's this beautiful woman, and, uh, and, and you know, he, he, so he tells this lie. He says, surely the fear of God's not in this place. In other words, they don't care about what's right and what's wrong in God's eyes. They don't care about the commandments of God. They don't care about who God is. They don't even recognize him as God probably. And so he says, surely I thought the fear of God's not in this place, and so I lied. Which I think is kind of funny because it's like, you're just admitting that you didn't trust God because you were afraid of what the man could do unto you. And so you're saying, I thought, surely the fear of God's not in this place. I was like, well, is the fear of God in you that you would do that? And, but it's normal for us all to fear for our lives and uh, make bad decisions. <clears throat> but anyway, that, shows, that verse right there shows you what it means to fear God. Okay, this, it's this, this worldview that says God of the Bible is the one in charge. He's supreme. And so we're going to do whatever he says. We're going to fear him more than anybody else. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Now, Proverbs chapter 1 is talking about wisdom. Uh, the, whole book, the whole book of Proverbs is about wisdom. And look at verse 21. This is wisdom who is personified as a lady. Okay, um, and we're talking about godly wisdom, so sometimes people will, uh, they will interpret this as though this is, this is God speaking. And it's not necessarily God speaking. This is wisdom personified, but it's the wisdom of God, and so there, it, there is some application there. Okay, but here's what it says. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of concourse. In the openings of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long? Ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel, and would not of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. Okay, so, so wisdom here saying, look, I'm not, you know, you're not going to be able to find me. Talking about godly wisdom. You're not going to be able to find me because... Uh, you know, you have already turned uh, on God, and you love simplicity, you love foolishness, and all this stuff. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that you could probably interpret that, but 
But wisdom is saying here, like, I'm going to laugh at your calamity when it comes because you rejected the fear of the Lord. Now, over and over in Proverbs, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, and so the idea is that uh, before you can even learn anything that God wants you, the, the great truths of this world, uh, the great truths of, of the Bible, you know, you have to have a fear for the Lord. And so this is why, you know, uh, people are, the Bible says, are willingly ignorant. Okay, which means they rejected God and they chose not to fear the Lord. And as a result, they're ignorant of the things of God. And so they interpret the evidence of this world that, you know, things just spontaneously came into being like from this big explosion. And there was no force that brought that in other than just the natural force that already existed. But it wasn't God because it was. And they're just all these things that as a Christian, you're looking at that saying, how could you believe that? Like that takes a lot of faith. I mean, like more faith than I have in the Bible <laughs> to believe that just everything just came from nothing with absolutely no origin, no supreme being that could have brought it into existence. There are people that believe some weird stuff out there. And people look at the evidence of uh, the flood and say they'll deny a world flood and they'll uh, say that the, everything in the Bible is a myth. And, and even though every culture has a, a, a flood legend, okay, they have some kind of thing. And some of them are very, very close to what we see in the Bible. Uh, they'll say, no, 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 that didn't happen. That's just like, they all got that from the Bible and they made up their own stuff. And it's like, that's foolishness. And I'm not a smart guy when it comes to science and stuff like that. Uh, but I just look at most science that's out there right now. People are like, oh, you got to trust science. Oh, you got to believe science. This scientists, they know. They've done their study. Yeah, and then 10 years, everything changes. And they're like, no, 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 they didn't know because uh, science is constantly changing. And science, you just got to go with it. It's like, oh, here's, what, here's what doesn't change. And here's what I'm going to believe. It's the word of God. And I'm going to trust God over the ignorant people who are willingly ignorant because they turn their back and they refuse to believe in God. Okay, so... <clears throat> This is what the fear of God is. It's a, it's a choice. You see that they chose not to fear God. They are willingly ignorant. And then we see that uh, it's, it's a, a decision to fear God above all else. Now, we live in a nation that fears just about everything except God. <laughs> We fear everything. I mean, if you think about it. And we live in a country that is historically a Christian country. Right? I don't know when we stopped. I know for sure that when Obama was in office, we stopped calling ourselves a Christian nation, at least from the government standpoint, because he said, no, we are a humanist nation. Like, we believe in all religions. And, uh, and I was like, he just said it. Like, he, that is what America is. You get, the, you get the king that you deserve. I mean, the Bible teaches us that. And our people wanted a leader like that. And so, therefore, you know, it just kind of shows where we are as a nation. Now, obviously, that's not everybody. But I'm saying in a nation where you could go down the streets of any, any major city and knock on the doors, and you're probably going to get out of 10 doors that you knock on, you're probably going to get over half of that. I mean, I'm, I'm being generous here. Uh, over half of that, probably more, closer to like 8, maybe 8 out of 10, uh, you know, that are going to say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, so you're thinking, well... It looks like we live in a Christian nation. I mean, there's a whole lot more Christians than anything else. But have you ever talked to them? I'm telling you, they're not Christian. <laughs> okay. We live in a humanist uh, nation. Talking to a guy yesterday in, uh, in Humboldt, we went back out there, and I didn't even knock on one door. Uh, there was a guy outside enjoying the weather, and I started talking to him. And uh, I mean, I did knock on a door after this, but uh, I talked to this guy the majority of, of the time. And, uh, and, and, he said he was Methodist. He said, oh, yeah, I go to church. I, I, I'm a Methodist and everything. And as we got to talking, he basically said, I mean, I believe every religion, like they're doing what they can and they're following it the best of their ability. I mean, he said pretty much, he said, the way I look at it, pretty, pretty much everybody goes to heaven unless they're really, really wicked. And, uh, and I kept trying to get the gospel and he's just kind of like talking over me and shutting me down. And he just pretty much had his mind made up. And I'm like, here's a guy that claims to be Christian. He says he's a member of a Methodist church. And, 
<laughs> and he's, and he, but look, there are people that have, are Baptists who really, if you talk to them, they say the same. They claim to be Baptists, but they say the same things. And so it doesn't matter what people call themselves. What do they believe? And I'm telling you, we live in a nation that doesn't fear God. You can go to the average church, the average, probably independent, fundamental Baptist church. And if you start listening to the people talk and you start investigating a little bit, you'll find out that they fear a lot of things in this earth a lot more than they fear God. It doesn't mean they're not saved. It's just the reality of the human nature, and it's a big sin that we have, that we fear other things more than God. Okay, so uh, most of our population, again, names the name of Christianity, but they have little knowledge or concern about God's Word. And what's funny about that, too, is that most people think that their, that their works are going to get them to heaven, right? And so what blows my mind is, like, if you really thought God's going to judge you according to your works and that's what's going to get you in heaven, why wouldn't you be living, like, a more holy life and, like, just constantly reading your Bible and constantly trying to earn God's favor because you want to go to heaven? And this is the most bizarre thing because we teach... Works doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. And it's just putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. And people are like, oh, you're just giving people a license to sin. I'm like, that's funny because I preach harder against sin than most preachers out there that are preaching a lordship salvation. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand how people get so confused. But what it comes down to is no fear of God. No fear of God. Or a little fear of God, you know. More fear about what people, what their fellow Christians might think. More fear about what... Uh, how the world might receive them by the way that they act and, and all these kinds of things. So let me give you a few things here that, that people fear in our world today. <clears throat> Here's an interesting one, global warming. <laughs> I don't think anybody, I don't know if anyone in here actually fears that. But man, you go around, I just heard that they, uh, did you guys hear that there's some national like glacier monument, I don't know what it was, some na national park or something like that, who has a sign that says by year 2022, this glacier will be gone. And here recently they had to update that sign <laughs> because it's still there. And, uh, but they're like, no, no, but it is shrinking, it is shrinking. And you give it another decade and it'll be gone. <laughs> like, and here's the thing, it might be true. It might be true. Look, let me go on record saying global warming might be a thing. I mean, I don't think it is a thing. <laughs> who, who knows? It might be a thing. I'm just not afraid of it. <laughs> I know what my, I know my etern, my etern, where my eternal life is going to be. I know who's in charge of all these things. I know that things are going to get really bad in time, you know, at some point. And I know who holds the, the future. You know, I don't know who holds tomorrow. Uh, look at Second Peter chapter three. But this is a thing, man. Every uh, it tends to be more of the liberal uh, platform, but every political leader, you know, is talking about global warming and how you got to uh, go to electric cars and wind turbines and all these things that have been proven not to really do more for our environment <laughs> than, uh, you know, definitely uh, not what they're claiming that it does. <clears throat> And they go on their airplanes and use up all that fuel to go do a speech where they, <laughs> they condemn us for having cars that burn fuel and uh, all this kind of weird stuff. Okay, look at Proverbs, I mean, I'm sorry, for, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse, starting in verse 9. <clears throat> the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now, I listened to, uh, to uh, I almost called him pastor. I listened to Brother Austin's message here when he preached for in my absence last week. And I know he preached on this subject of repentance and talked about this verse. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, they should put their faith in Jesus Christ. They should turn to him and stop uh, believing in other things that they're believing and choose to trust in Jesus, I think, is the application of this verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and, er and the earth also in the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now let's say that God put a timeline on that. And he said, by the year 2023, all these things should happen. What would I be doing this very minute? Would I be running around like a chicken with his head cut off? Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The elements are going to burn with the fervent heat and <laughs> they're going to melt and, and all this stuff. 
No, I would just say, hey, God's true. What we see him saying is actually happening. Say, oh, so you do believe in global warming. I believe God's going to do some global warming for sure. <laughs> okay. But here's the thing. Here's what it says in verse 11. Seeing that, that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for that hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire uh, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So all these political leaders are like, global warming, global warming, global warming. They're afraid of global warming. And all the people that are listening to them, hey, we need to stop doing this. We need to stop selling this. Our grandkids aren't going to have uh, an earth to live in. And, and, you know, the grandkids are the ones getting out there saying, how dare you, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't care about our future and all this kind of stuff. Well, here's the thing. God says the time's coming. However it's going to happen, this earth is going to be burned up. And he says, knowing that, Think about how you ought to live in all holy in, in, in holiness and righteousness. Do you think the world is worried about that? You know, they're not pff, righteousness. We don't care about that. We just care about this earth not burning up. Isn't that foolish? <laughs> it's like I fear my death and the end of this world more than I feel more than I fear the person who created this world and told me in the Bible what to do and how to live. <laughs> and so the big ridiculous thing about people in this earth is that they, even the ones that claim to believe in God, is that they really fear other things more than they fear God who is in control of those things. <laughs> okay? Let me give you another example. War. There are people that, I mean, throughout history, for sure, you know, we got to build these bunkers because of nuclear bombs and we got to do all this kind of stuff. And, and oh, did you hear about North Korea? And oh, did you hear about China? And, did, and we're going to go to war. And, and uh, I remember Trump, I mean, people were talking like Trump had his finger on the, on the button ready to, you know, start World War III or something. Well, let me tell you this World War III is coming. World War III is coming, okay? The Bible talks about it in pretty good detail uh, that this is going to come. And the Antichrist, as we call him, the beast, is going to uh, rise up. And there's going to be a one-world uh, type government. And there's going to take a lot of war to get to that point. And, uh, and you say, well, I'm afraid of war. I don't want war. I don't want it either. But I'm more afraid of the God who is already said in his word that all these things are going to happen. And he says, hey, here's how I want you to live. And I want you to be watching. I want you to be waiting. And I want you to be doing all these things. And endure to the end because, uh, because I will come back. <laughs> and so uh, we're supposed to go through all those things, go through the tribulation and all the trials and stuff like that, and, uh, and follow the Lord. The Bible says this in the Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is prepared against the day of battle. Okay, I think that we ought to be prepared. I think we ought to... You know, I'm for arming yourself. I'm for having, a secu having security. You know, you say, oh, are you saying that you're more afraid of people breaking into your house than God? No, I'm just following God's instructions because God, you know, gives us that uh, responsibility to take care of our families and all that kind of stuff. But when the time comes, I, I'm just assuming God's going to give me the wisdom to, to use whatever I have available, whether it's a baseball bat or whatever. <laughs> okay, but here's a, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but... Safety is of the Lord. So what you really want to do, if you want safety, what you need to do is be close with God and say, God, I need you to protect me. Okay, we go soul winning in some kind of shady neighborhood sometimes. And we were in this one neighborhood. It actually didn't look like that bad of a neighborhood. In fact, I would have thought, you know, hey, it's going to be pretty unreceptive here because they're a little upper, not upper class, but, you know, nice cars and stuff like that. And, uh, but of course, you can go to bad neighborhoods and they got nice cars now. <laughs> cars worth more than their house. Okay, but, uh, uh, but anyway, we went in this one neighborhood one time and, and probably like three doors that we knocked on in, the, in that neighborhood said, what are you guys doing out here? Like, this is a rough neighborhood. You better, you should be scared. <laughs> There's people out there, there was just a shooting down the road and all this kind of stuff. And when we were in Oklahoma City, we worked on the bus ministry, and we literally had shootings while we were there. Uh, you know, there was gunshots, and we're like hiding behind cars, like, what's going on? People walking out of their apartment, like, oh, another one? <laughs> and, uh, and you say, man, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you say, hey, no soul winning in rough neighborhoods because, you know, we don't want anybody to get hurt? Well, here's why, because I obey God rather than man. And I fear God more than I fear man. And if God wants me to die from gunshot in a rough neighborhood where we're preaching the gospel, 
I don't, I don't want it. If I think about it too much, I'll start getting a little scared. But at the end of the day, I got to obey God. Why? Because I fear God. And I'm going to live with Him for eternity. I'm only on this earth for a short time. Okay? And so, uh, not telling anyone to go be crazy and go get shot tonight, uh, but at the same time, we got to fear God. <clears throat> How about pestilence? Well, this is a big one. Everywhere you go. That same guy that, uh, that was talking to me about being Methodist and uh, everybody's going to go to heaven anyway, uh, yet he was terrified of COVID. And he's like, he didn't have a mask on at the time, but he was like, man, I, pretty much everywhere I go, I wear a mask. I backed up out of being kind. I backed up a little bit because I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty close to him. I'm definitely closer to six feet, and I don't know how he feels about that. Maybe he's giving me a little warning. He said, oh, and I've had all the vaccines and this and that. And then I said something. I, I don't remember what it was, but... It was almost kind of like, well, I'm not too worried about that. It's not that big of a deal. And trust me, I mean, I do, a lot of people are dying and stuff like that. I do think it's real. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, I just have a different view on it in the, because of the sense that I know God's in charge, okay? And I think that a lot of this is just him bringing this upon our nation. But, uh, but anyway, this guy all of a sudden was demonstrating that he's terrified, even though from his perspective, everybody's going to heaven unless they're really, really bad, and he must think that he's not really, really bad, uh, but he's terrified of COVID. He's like, I want to live to be 100 years old. I've got it made up in my mind. And I said, me too. I, I, you know, as I get closer to that, I'm like, that's a long way away. But whenever I was a kid, I remember thinking, hey, I want to be 100 years old. And I told my dad, you know, he, let's make a pact. We're going to live to be 100. I knew we wouldn't be 100 at the same time. <laughs> we're going to both live to be, that we're going to have that goal to live to be 100. And, uh, and so, like, this guy was real sold on that. He's like, man, this everyone. And then Opie's is shutting down. All these places shutting down because of COVID. I don't know if you knew that. Humble Opie's is going to be shut down. So uh, I don't think it is yet. So if you want to go eat there this afternoon, this message is brought to you by Opie's. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, <clears throat> Of course, I don't know. Maybe there's a reason it's shut down. <laughs> Go to Chanute. They're still open. And uh, so anyway, is pestilence something to worry about? Well, for sure. I don't want to get sick. I, I don't care COVID or not COVID. If somebody's standing next to me and they're like, ah, ah, and there's some snot coming down, I'm kind of like, I really don't feel like getting sick. Like, I got a pretty good record of attendance at church <laughs> and all that stuff, and, and I don't want to get sick. But look, at the end of the day, if you know what I've also done before, uh, this isn't patting myself on the back, but here's what I'm saying. I remember the, uh, I, I think I told this story the other day, uh, the other day actually, but I remember when I had to take care of this girl that was having an ep epilepsy, uh, some kind of a seizure, and I went and I thought, you know, and I've, I've been told that they swallow their tongue sometimes. And she was obviously biting her tongue because there was blood coming out of her mouth. And I went in there and I said, well, I don't want her to swallow her tongue. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I put my hand in her mouth. I don't have gloves on or anything like that. And she's got blood. And, I'm, and you're, aren't you afraid that you're going to contract something and you're going to die? Not really, because number one, I know where I'm going. <laughs> number two, like I think God, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to help this person out. Now you guys are going to be afraid to drink after me or anything, got AIDS or something. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, like, in the moment, in the moment when you're dealing with something, like, I know good Christian people who got COVID, and many of them died. We just talked about a missionary that died, and uh, some in here have family members that died. And in the moment, as Christians, we say, well, God's in charge, and he knows what's, he knows what's going on. And so, uh, you know, there's not much more that you can do Beyond that, I'm not telling you again not to be careful, not to uh, uh, take precautions and kind of and that kind of stuff. But did the Bible ever say that pestilence is coming? Now, I've preached this a thousand times in the last couple of years, so I'm not going to go there now. But Matthew 24 makes it very clear. How do you know the end's coming? Wars, earthquakes in diverse places, pestilence. You know, so diseases are going to be a thing, and they're going to get worse. But what do we do about it? Well, we keep assembling. We keep worshiping God. We keep preaching the gospel. We keep doing the things that we're supposed to do. Try to be safe, yeah. But the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Who am I going to fear first and foremost? God or the pestilence that he's in charge of? I'm going to fear God. You know, it's, uh, and so that's the, the healthy view here. Here's, uh, here is something that a lot of people fear, having family, having children, in other words, having a, raising a family. 
And there are people that are afraid of that. I don't want to get married. I don't want to have kids. I don't want to do that because it's too scary. You know, it's, I don't want to have kids because they cost too much. Right? And so our world has created this, uh, this planned parenthood, you know, which is not uh, parenthood at all. It's like the opposite, right? This planned parenthood, this uh, uh, family planning uh, idea where it's like, um, you know, hey, we got to be wise about this. There's overpopulation, and, and you want to have nice things, right? So you don't want to have children. And I know a lot of Christians who have, have made that choice. Now, there's some who don't have a choice. They can't have children, and I understand that. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's just the, where they got, where, what the position God put them in. But there are others who w- w- make that choice. We don't want to have children because it will complicate things. And, uh, and I mean, that's between them and God, but the Bible makes it clear. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full, right? Because ch- uh, uh, children are an, a heritage of the Lord. Uh, so, anyway, the idea then in our nation became this idea of abortion and, you know, birth control to stop the babies from being born and all this kind of stuff. And where does that stem from? It stems from a fear of the unknown. It stems from a fear of, well, I'm not going to be able to afford it. I'm not going to. And yet, there's no fear of God. But a lot of people, even, even a lot of Christians. Now, for the most part in our society right now, I think from an evangelical Christian standpoint, they're against abortion. But yet, it's not ever going to, it's, it's obviously not getting voted you know, they're not laws being passed against. I guess in some places they're trying. Uh, but for the most part, our, as a nation, they're like, well, people ought to have that choice to be able to do that. And so uh, probably, I don't know the percentage of the population, but a lot of people are okay with that kind of, it's my body, my choice kind of idea. Because they're more afraid of the possibility of not having enough money, the possibility of having to have a responsibility of taking care of a child, the possibility of all these things, rather than fearing God, who, who, who says, thou shalt not kill, for one thing, and they'll, they'll go ahead and do that instead. Now, this idea of abortion, boy, doesn't that fit right into the text that we're talking about. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. And in verse 15, said, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Sifra, and the other was uh, of Pua. And he said, When you do the, of- the office of the midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stool, if it be a son... Then ye shall kill him, but if he be a daughter, then shall, uh, she shall live. Now, I'm glad, as far as I know, no doctors in the United States right now have, like, like have to sign something that says, if someone wants an abortion, I will, I will do it. I don't think that that's any, something that doctors have to do. Uh, before we had Viviana, we asked our doctor what he felt about abortion, because you kind of want to know before you, you have a doctor that's going to, you know, be caring for your child. You kind of don't want to know where they stand on the life uh, of, a, of, a, of a child. And he was against it, but he's like, hey, I wouldn't judge, you know, anybody that does that or whatever. But he said, I'm against it. I won't perform abortion and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that was good to hear. But the thing is, like, that was a pretty, you know, that was a pretty vague, vague answer. Most of the doctors out there probably would do it. To be honest with you, if they had to sign something that says, well, I'm going to lose my license if I don't say I'll perform an abortion for anybody that wants an abortion. But I hope that if that day ever came, there'd be enough Christian doctors out there to be like, nope, you can take away my license, you can, uh, you know, put me in jail, do whatever you want to do, but I'm not going to uh, do this. And so this is kind of the case you got of these midwives. Now, I've got to go real quickly here, but the, the title of the message is God Deals Well with Those Who Fear Him. So let's talk about some ways... Uh, let me see here. I'm just going to skip to the last point here. So let's talk about some ways that we might demonstrate that we fear Him. Now, let me let me real quickly get uh, address something in the other point. I could actually take more off of the third point. I don't know why I'm telling you guys all this, but Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. Thinking out loud, I guess. 
So my second point was this. In what way does God, these are all just questions obviously, what way does God deal with those who fear him? Okay, so we say that he deals well with those who fear him. He dealt well with the, the Hebrew midwives for, uh, because they feared him. So in what way does he deal well with them? Let me read this to you. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat, this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow, sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add a cubit unto his stature? And what... Uh, and, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lily, lilies of the field, how they grow and toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. So he's saying, hey, consider the birds, consider the flowers. You know, if God's going to take care of those, doesn't he love a human being so much more than those? And he's going to take care of you. And so he's like, don't worry about those things. Now, some people have taken this out of context and they've, and they've basically got an excuse to like, you know, live off the government or just, uh, I've heard people say, I just want to preach the word full time and, and, you know, just live off of love offerings or something like that. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. And so the Bible does make it very clear that a person should work. But here's the idea that he's saying here. He's like, in every situation in your life, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, this is talking to disciples. I don't mean just the 12 disciples, but all those who want to follow Christ. You know, and I feel very strongly that a person can put their trust in Jesus Christ and he's going to heaven and not follow the Lord wholeheartedly, not be a disciple like this and leave everything and forsake everything and, and all that like he says to his disciples to do. I believe there are people that out there that, you know, kind of still love, they still love uh, the things of this world, okay? Now, actually, that puts them at enmity with God, but it doesn't mean that their soul is not saved. It just means while they're on earth doing that, God's not going to deal well with them, okay, because they're not fearing him. However, if you're going to be his disciple, if you're going to seek him and, uh, and, and, and lay up rewards in heaven and all that kind of stuff that he tells his disciples to do, he says this, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, where in there did he say he's going to give you a big mansion? He's going to build you a special home. Now, he did build these midwives. Apparently, he allowed them to have a house of some sort because of their because they feared God. But do you know that he never promises to even give us a place to to sleep? He doesn't promise. That. Now you would think that that's one of the bare essentials that God's going to make sure he gives you. But and I, maybe I'm really too far into this, but here's what he says. He says, hey, look, you worry about what you're going to eat, you worry about what you're going to drink, you worry about the clothes that you're going to put on. Don't worry about those things. Seek God, follow God, and I will take care of all that. He doesn't even say he's going to give you a place to live, which is interesting because the disciples asked Jesus where he lived. And he's like, I mean, he just stayed with, he stayed wherever he could go at the time. But he's like, hey, foxes have holes, you know, birds have nests. And he's like, I don't even have a place to lay my head. And so Jesus just kind of, you know, wandered about just following the, following the Lord. Now, he's a hard worker, and he did a whole lot of stuff doing his father's business. But, uh, but he wasn't worried about those things, and God took care of him. I know he is God, but I'm talking about the earthly man, the son of man. And uh, the same thing is true for us, okay? We, when we go through this life and we say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice this. I'm going to give up that. I'm going to put first the kingdom of God. You know what he's already promised? You're not going to starve. You're not going to starve to death. Now, has any Christian ever starved to death? Probably but, you know, I remember the verse where David said, hey, I've never seen, uh, I've never seen God, uh, God's people begging bread. I'm paraphrasing that verse. But, and so like, the point is that generally speaking, God's going to take care of you. He's going to give you a place to, uh, I mean, he's going to give you a, a something to eat, something to drink. You know, he's going to bring some, some ravens to come bring some, some food for you. <laughs> some, uh, some quail, you know, are going to fly in in the middle of the night and you can eat them. Right? That's how he, did, that's how he dealt with them in the Old Testament. Uh, he feeds you from this brook. I mean, you can drink from this brook. You know, what about parasites? <laughs> the thing is, just seek, just fear God and put first, you know, what does God want? 
He wants me to be righteous. He wants me to live holy. He wants me to do all these things. And then he's going to take care of the rest. And look, he seems to reward us way more than that, doesn't he? I mean, the fact that I don't have to starve to death. I mean, I, I have a whole lot more than just not starving to death. <laughs> okay, I got an abundance of food. Uh, I've got plenty of clothes to wear. I almost wore a tie this morning that I've had since I was like, uh, probably like 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it was a little in bad condition. But I said, like, I haven't worn that in a long time. And I put it on, and I was like, I've got a lot of ties. Like, why do I want to wear this one that's this raggedy? <laughs> And so I went to the tie. I got a little thing that you push a button. It goes, and I got like 50, 60 ties. And I'm like, good grief, you know. I'm, I'm blessed. I mean, I don't even like ties. <laughs> I got them coming out my nose from over the years. God blesses us in way more than just like taking care of our basic needs. But the thing is, even if you get to this point where you're like, oh, no, I don't have all the things that I want. Who cares? Follow God, and he's going to take care of those things. And so that's the point that he's trying to make. So real quickly on the last point, and I'll fly through it. So some ways that we might demonstrate that we fear him. Okay? Basically, it's, I'll just paraphrase some things here. Uh, I mean, summarize some things here. We need to be more afraid of offending God than offending the world. Okay, look at Matthew chapter 10. Verse 28. And this is why I made mention of this earlier. It says, Fear not them which, can, uh, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now if a person is unsaved and they don't know for sure they're going to heaven, this verse really applies, doesn't it? It's like, it's like pff, I better fear, not fear man, I better fear uh, either the God who can not just kill this body, but also kill my soul in hell. But I, I, what I was trying to say earlier is that I believe this applies to us as Christians as well, because even though he's not going to destroy our soul in hell because we're saved, he still is a powerful God that has that ability and that's what he is doing with people. So we need to respect that and say, thank you, God, that you saved me. Why in the world would I, would I just scoff at that and make a mockery out of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross by living a life of sin? You know, whenever he did that for me, why wouldn't I want to serve him loyally? And, uh, and, and then he's also given us promises that he's going to bless us a hundredfold for all the things that we uh, do for him and give up for him in this life. We need to preach the gospel even when people don't want to hear it. A lot of reasons that people won't preach the gospel, they won't go door knocking or share the gospel with friends, family, loved ones, whatever, is fear. They're not going to like me if I do that. They're going to be offended. And uh, first of all, you should care enough about them and their soul to give them the gospel. But second of all, it's a commandment from God, and we ought to fear God more than we fear those people who might slam the door on us or call us a bad name or, or even wave a gun at us. We've got people in our, uh, in our church that have had guns waved at them while they're pre preaching the gospel. Even, listen to this, because some people disagree with me on this, but even when the police officers are called and they say, hey, you can't go there and preach the gospel. Now, in Kansas City, for instance, there's a lot of places to preach the gospel, so if they tell us not to go there, we can probably just kind of skip that for a while, and we've got plenty of other doors to knock. But at the end of the day, We've got a responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And, you, and nobody can tell me that, oh, where do you see in the Bible where God would, you know, the government would say, don't preach the gospel there, and we should still go preach the gospel there. Really? Have you read the book of Acts? <laughs> I mean, they literally beat him and said, don't preach the gospel. And he said, okay. And he went and he preached the gospel, like right outside the doors of the prison. <laughs> and why did he say that? We must obey God rather than man. Okay, that's the principle. We need to stand for righteousness even when we're pressured in this culture not to. The culture like, well, all my friends aren't doing this, and, and they're not dressing this way, and they're not listening to this kind of music, and, and maybe I just need to be like everybody else. You know, people at work, they're all going out and drinking. Maybe it's all right to have a little bit. I mean, you know, all things in moderation, right? And No, obey God rather than man and say, look, I'm not going to go there. I don't care if people are offended by me. They don't like me anymore. And guess what? You give up on the things of the world, and you start serving God. You don't have to worry about who, you, you don't have to worry about which friends to give up because they're going to leave you. <laughs> they're going to be like, I don't want to be around that guy. He's a, he's a religious nut. Okay? And that just kind of weeds it all out. <laughs> 
Just live for God and don't fear man, but fear God. God doesn't give us his, the commandments that he gives us because he just wants us to obey a lot of hard things, to, you know, like he hates us. Every kid, you know, when, his, when their parents give them rules, they're just like, hey, you hate me. You just don't want me to have any fun. You won't let me date that person. You won't let me do this or that. And it's like, I'm not giving you rules because I hate you. I'm giving you rules because I love you. <laughs> I don't want you to do those things. And the Bible says in 1 John 5 that his commandments aren't grievous. And if we love him, we'll keep his commandments because, you know, we're reciprocating that love. And we're reciprocating that love to other people by trying to live for them, uh, live, serve, serve them and, and, uh, and do all these kind of things. And we do all this because God has made it clear in his word by, by examples. And then he's made the promise in his word. And then probably everyone in here can ex examine our own lives and say, the times in my life where I followed God and I gave him the most of my life and my effort. You know, not everything in this world, not everything in the world went good during that time. But the blessings that came from God, I'm not talking about the blessings that the world wants you to have. But sometimes they give you those too. You know, more abundantly than the world. Like, how, you know, how are you, how are you able to have all those things? Well, it's, it's not me. It's just God blessing me, you know. And so we can trust that God's going to deal well with those who fear him. So the key is just to fear him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray you help us all live according to these words and, uh, and uh, be like the Hebrew midwives there that feared you more than they feared even the government who had the power to take their lives. And, uh, and certainly... Uh, not any of the, the, the world who, who would have uh, tried to persuade them to do otherwise. I pray, Lord, that you help us to, to walk in your truth the most, the, to the best of our ability and not to follow after mammon and the things of this world and, and wealth and all that kind of luxuries. Uh, but let us focus primarily on your kingdom and righteousness and we're so thankful for your promise that you'll take care of us beyond that. And we know that you'll deal well with those of us who fear you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.